Your name's not Dan, you're not coming in. So we've heard from Mark Archer from Alternate all about how he uh, came to be an Alternate, those famous costumes. Uh, but I want to explore with him in this episode uh, where how he ended up as a pop star. Uh, and I mean, bet he had a, a heck of a lot of fun along the way, even though he says he was an introvert. But let's find out. Uh, Mark, you uh, you ended up uh, on Radio 1, Top of the Pops. Loki Sutherland asks, what was that experience like? Were you treated like proper pop stars, chauffeured in, that sort of stuff? Um. No, <laughs> we weren't because, because we weren't. We were just a, a bunch of lads from from Stafford. Just the, they didn't take us seriously at all. Um, you know, like Steve Wright did a, a thing where he took the mick out of the whole rave scene where they got someone to make like a bit of a ravey track and a girl singing really badly over the top. And it was just taking the mick out of the, the, the performers that came on top of the pops. Um you, it was a really surreal experience because you've been watching Top of the Pops probably all your life, you know, and, and then all of a sudden you're on it and you couldn't believe quite what was going on. And and all the, the proper pop stars were, were, you know, walking around. Um, it's filmed at the same place that EastEnders was filmed. So the EastEnders cast were, you know, I went to go to the toilet and Jules, uh, the, the West Indian guy who used to be in uh, EastEnders in the, the early 90s, he was coming out of the toilet. So, oh, my God, there's Jules. There's Dot Cotton, you know, stuff. The, the Mitchell brothers were in the canteen. Um, but you, it, it was an eye-opener because you, you'd watch it on a Thursday and it, it starts, you know, with the music, then they introduce a clip and then either someone comes on or they play a video and it's recorded exactly how it's shown. So... You'll get in your you you do so many practice rehearsals. You one where you just stand there. Then next, move how you're going to move later on. It's like, I don't know, I'm going to move later on. All these lights on you. Then you put your costume and do a costume rehearsal. And then there's you do the proper one. And it's like a big oblong oblong room with four stages, one on each wall. So they'll do the music, introduce one. The cameras and all the crowd will rush to the front. There's not many people there. They herded right to the front of one of the stages, film that bit. The next group are on the next stage. They'll do the link, and then the cameras and the crowd will move to the front of that stage. You know, so we were watching Rosala do uh, her her track. And then, yeah, you're ready, five, four, three, poof, off it goes. They introduce you and and start wiggling about. And you were faking that one too, obviously. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's, there's no no one plays. It's extremely rare for anyone just play live on to the pops. It's all it's all miming. But they went through a phase just to coincide with the rave scene where it was all sampled vocals. You've got to have a singer on, right? So we had a girl who danced in the activate video, and she could sing. But when we got to the top of the pops and it was like three, two, one, you're live, boom. Oh, millions of people are watching me. I'll decide I'm not going to be that great now. Yeah. You didn't bring the three-year-old along. <laughs> no, no. She she was on the video screen behind us because it, it, otherwise it wouldn't have worked. But I mean, I, I think the first appearance um, we thought because of how it went, we're not going to go up in the charts. But we 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 went from I think it was like eleven up to um, three eventually, um, and I took my pot of Vicks off on stage and plunked it there, just as you know people could could see. Even though the only reason we had Vicks in the mass was just to make them smell nice. <laughs> uh, Loki Sutherland also wants me to mention Bill the Robot, who toured with Alternate in the early 90s. He was on the, your first Top of the Pops appearance, also in the Activate video, because Bill was a family friend of Loki's. Um, right. And he passed away fairly recently. He was yeah, a legend yeah. on the rave scene, featured in countless rave event videos. Tell us your fondest memories of uh, Bill the Robot. Well, I mean, we, we we saw him. I think it was at the eclipse, and he'd been hired to to go around the crowd and people dancing away. And all of a sudden, someone looms up next to them, and it just absolutely blows people's heads. I mean, we we took him um, to a gig in LA, um, and when we got over there, and the the crowd were just 
I thought we didn't go down very well because everyone stood there with their gobs open. But they were just like, I had letters from fans, you know, after they sent yeah. like letters in saying like, we cannot believe, you know, that you've come over to LA and, and played. It was absolutely, it's like the most amazing experience of my life. And he was in the crowd walking around, just people just absolutely freaking out because he was there. Um, but we we did a gig. Um, Birmingham was going to be the uh, city of music for 1992. And Activate was still just in the charts at tail end of 91. And we got booked by Birmingham City Council. And I thought it's going to be in some kind of village hall. It's going to be a really dodgy little gig. It wasn't looking forward to it at all. But we were going to play in Wigan Pier later that night. So it's all cool. And then my dad phoned up and he's like, have you been on the news at all? No. So that that thing, it, I'd assume it's what you're doing in Birmingham Centenary Square. It's 45,000 people there. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just, uh, and we were playing for 15 minutes. So we got on stage, started doing the tunes. There was like at least 2,000 proper like ravers right at the front, like going for it. And then it was a sea of people as far as you could see. And one of our dancers did like a, a gambol forward roll onto the stage and stood up like that. The crowd went mental. Off it. They're making a bit much noise for John. Didn't realise the robot had just walked on stage and it, like the whole crowd just went absolutely crazy because he'd come on and started doing his body pop. Well, it just shows you, doesn't it, there, Mark, that you can create some uh, rave classics. You know, <laughs> real, you know, it costs you money, it costs you blood, it costs you sweat, it costs you tears. You had to wear those fucking suits that were boiling every week. Yep. But you know what? <laughs> Stick a robot suit on, and you're going to get forty five thousand people absolutely yeah. loving you. So there's, yeah. I don't know. There's, there's a lesson in there somewhere, and I'm not yeah, sure yeah. what it is. Um, Chris Peters asks, how did you feel that your music that was pretty underground made it onto such a commercial platform as Top of the Pops? I mean, he says, what an achievement that is. It was, I mean, it blows your head to think that anyone's going to buy your stuff. We were just making music that we liked. If anyone buys it, then, you know, it's a complete bonus. Um, so with, with like the, the first alternate EP buying, because of the, the good value and then Infiltrate coming out and doing so well. So everyone was waiting for like a follow-up. Um, but for it to go into the charts the way it did was purely, I think, because we were doing so many PAs and it was on promo. And you imagine how many raves were going off each weekend uh, in the UK. So, you know, any one time there could have been like three or four raves up and down the country all at the same time. Now, if only a small percentage of those people bought your record, boom, you catapulted straight in the charts. And radio had nothing to do with it. You know, we didn't get any radio one daytime play at all. You know, it was only the evening DJs who would, who would play it. So it was catapulted into the charts. Then you've got, and it's something that I never thought about until recently, you've got like 11-year-old kids sat at home watching Tom of the Pops and then this comes on and they've never heard anything like it. And they're like, what on earth is this? And they go out and buy it. So then you go further up the charts. You know, so it's it's not something you can control. It's something that, that happens and you're just, you just go with it. Um, you know, so we can because Activate was doing well in the charts, then we get more bookings to play at the weekends, you know, and it, it snowballs. So, so Top of the Pops had a huge impact upon your career? To oh, totally, totally. Right. You can't, you, you know, and it's, <clears throat> people go on about pop music. Pop short for popular, mm. you know. I'm not sure that many people want to make music that no one likes. <laughs> So it's a difference. It's the difference, you know. You can get underground music in the charts. It doesn't change the song. It doesn't suddenly make it a commercial song because you haven't made it to get in the charts. No. So you didn't feel like a pop act, <clears throat> or, or like no. you were selling out in any way. No, no, not not at all. We were just making the music that we wanted to make. Uh, did. Uh... 
how did the rave scene react to seeing you on Top of the Pops and getting chart success? And the reason I ask this is we interviewed <laughs> Lunacy on a previous episode. And if, if anyone listening to this hasn't listened to that, it's really worth doing because it's it's really enlightening about sort of accidental fame and, 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 and finding yourself accidentally on Top of the Pops and what that does for you and this sort of surreal career turn, I suppose. Mm. But um, he felt that particularly with Smarties, um, when they did Sesame Street, they were seen as a, a bit of a joke and then they were unable or they found it very difficult as Smarties to turn that around. And so then yeah. he went off on his own and became, as we know, lunacy and set up Night Force out of the back of it. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but he Actually, there was there was a backlash, he felt, to, mm. to people like those, like Smarties that were creating tunes a bit like Charlie, if that makes mm. sense. Did you feel that? <clears throat> Um, to do a, a, a tune where you've, you've used a sample like that, um, a lot of people would call it, you know, a, a gimmick track. So there's ultimately there's, you can't have a longevity in something where you've made a gimmick, you know, no matter how, how good the track is. Um, I, I think as with our image, it made it completely different because no one knew who was inside the suits. You know, I, I've only recently started getting recognised because I promoted myself as me rather than as alternate. I mean, we used to do a gig in front of, say, 10,000 people, go off, take the suits off, come back on stage to get the keyboards. People would think I was the janitor. You know, the, the dancers, everyone, oh, it's the dancers alternate. Oh me just get the keyboard and i'll go home it's all right so was it you know, was it was it um was it sort of was that was that good for you as someone who isn't a uh a, a, who's an, a bit of an introvert was it was it did it was it good that you were able to be so anonymous it must have been quite amusing really being quite anonymous but also yeah. so famous at the same time it, i I probably didn't think about it, but it, it, it must have helped because I don't think I'd have been able to to cope with, you know, people knowing now. Um, yes, but it, it also, the suits allowed because people couldn't see me, I could let go of it more, you know, and act a complete loon on stage, you know, jump about. And, and I, didn't, I didn't feel embarrassed. Um, so the, the suits helped without even thinking about it. Right. And and again, accidental success. Uh, and uh, did you uh, make much money from from those uh, from those pop tunes that you did ultimately create? I mean, Lunacy says that he largely wasted his money, but he did use it to create the studio that he that then allowed him to set up Night Force Records. So that's still going now. So yeah, there was, yeah. so we used it some of it, at least in, in a wise way. Did you did you make much off it? What did you use it on? Um, well, I managed to buy um, a house and, and, and a a decent car and and a, a studio because when like when we first started i had that that little casio sk1 sampler um and when we signed to network they gave us a, a, a small advance and i bought myself an akai sampler and then you gradually bought like one piece of kit at a time um i made frequency on um the, the Akai sampler, I was using it. I didn't even have a computer to sequence. I was using a drum machine that I bought from like a local music shop. <laughs> using that sequence and I'd, I'd got a, a 303. But that was like, that was where my setup ended. It was like three pieces of kit. Um, so used it to get myself like a, a proper studio you know i had like 808 909s uh 727 707 all the all the drum machines decent mackey desk um to the point where i could make music that i wanted to but didn't know how to in the in the late 80s you know i'd, I'd learned my trade by the the mid 90s unfortunately life life gets in the way and children and and unfortunately all all that's gone. I mean, the house is still there, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not living in it anymore. Uh, in terms of your rave credentials, you were, you were pushing the uh, the hardcore sound with you know heavy bass and that sort of stuff. Did, what did hard, what did the term hardcore mean to you? It, it, I mean, it changed. Um, it, it started off where the term only for the headstrong was used quite a lot um, for the people who 
stayed till the end and just wanted it that little bit harder. Um, and I mean, if you listen to a tune by Psychotropic called Only for the Headstrong, it's not hard at all by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> But you compare it to, you know, like the, the piano tunes. There is cer a certain direction that that songs were going in, and it got it got um, like Belgian influences come in, and the the hoovers and the chainsaw noises and and the stab sounds and and getting faster and faster. So it, it changed from when the term hardcore first died to say when it when it stopped being used. You know, just when like uh, say jungle took over as a term. And did you realise that you were helping to move the sound away from, from house to hardcore? Was it deliberate or was it just accidental? I, I, again, accident, you know, there was, a, <laughs> there was no think, plan. I think this is the watchword here, isn't there? Yeah, accidental yeah. across the whole interview. Every, everything's accidental. You were just making tunes. You'd hear something. Somebody had pushed the envelope a bit and go like a bit faster or use a different noise and be like, I like I like that, and then you do your take on it. I mean, I, I heard a story about how Gabber evolved. I mean, Gabber is a pretty extreme kind of music, going from your Belgian techno to Gabber. Mm. But apparently, one label, one of the producers, did something you know unbelievably hard as a B side, and then another label said, "Oh, we're 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 going to do something harder than you." So within the space of a few releases in six months, it had gone from, you know, your vamp kind of thing to something with a distorted kick drum, like absolutely pounding it out because they were trying to outdo each other. And with we, we DJs pitching tunes up in, in sets, then producers would make tunes faster. So the scene got faster and faster and faster. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the speed of, of the sound <laughs> in a bit, but did you get DJs and producers telling you that what you're doing is the way forward, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Was that, was it positive or was it based on record sales? So you could see that what you were doing was successful. How did you know? Um, I, I just think I had like a, an idea of, I like that. So I want to do something like that. Um, I, I know when it got as far as evaporate, some people had said like, I like your tunes like Armageddon. <laughs> evaporates gone a bit too you know like big sounding and they preferred the more underground things and i think that's when you know certain djs had started to go on a specific route you know and they got a sound whereas 8990 you played across the board, you then get DJs who were known for a particular sound. So that's when, you know, certain DJs would tell you they didn't like one thing, but they liked another thing, you know, depending on whether it fit in their, their sets or not. But I just had this, there's a kind of like formula with um, the, the alternate tracks where I wanted to get certain influences like an electro drum beat, uh, a, a sample off a, a track, from a couple of years previous that maybe, you know, the people who got into the rave scene hadn't heard and they might go back and listen to, you know, oh, that's where it's from. Right. Okay. And and who at the time did you view as your rivals, so to speak? Was it, uh, was it the, the shaman, the prodigy? Who else? I don't, I don't think apart from bizarre Inc, who were like hometown rivals because we were both from Stafford. Imagine um, being a rivalry with your old band, yeah, <laughs> with your old crew. <laughs> it, 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 imagine, being number, <laughs> imagine being number three in the charts and they were number four. Oh, yes, mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that that was you know that, that that was like the friendly rivalry between us and Bizarre Inc. Um, but I think you just can't. You were glad to be considered, you know, peers of. You know, people like the the Prodigy, Liquid, Awesome Three. You know, um, Shades of Rhythm, SL Two. You know, there there was like a, a certain range of groups who were you know knocking out um, what they call now bangers. Um, and and it was it's nice to be you know 
spoken about in the in the same sentences as as the rest of them. Well, uh, in terms of the prodigy, Ian S asks whether there was any rivalry, and the reason he says. Uh, what was the beef with the Prodigy? Why didn't they run with the original video for Brutal uh, 80 where they dress like the Prodigy with white uh, dodgy experience T-shirts? Um, right. There, there was never a, a, a beef with the Prodigy at all. In fact, we only ever met them once at a gig in 92 in Stafford. Uh, it was a starlight gig called Judgment Day. Um, but... People kept telling us that the Outer Space video was taking the Mickey out of us, um, <laughs> with, with Keith wearing the the white suit and the the mask doing the the dancing. They said, "Oh, they're taking the piss out of you. You want to do do something back?" And we'd already got a video um, for Brutality, which was we, we played Dance Energy and, and performed it, and the footage from that was used as as the video. But we decided to make another like tongue in cheek kind of mickey tank video um where someone had the dodgy experience written on the t-shirt um we got <laughs> we got a, a like a, a an old style wool mop and dyed it ginger and put a ski hat on it and danced it around um and john one of our dancers had like the plastic chains wrapped around him like keith did and and danced like keith in the video so he's it was kind of like you know, like a just a light-hearted Mickey take, but it wasn't. It wasn't the main, the main video. It was just something that we did with with someone from Stafford. I didn't even realise that it had, had made it out anywhere, and I found it on YouTube um, a couple of years ago, and I was I was surprised to find it there because I didn't think it had even surfaced. <laughs> to be honest, and. Uh... Did you have any idea if the product so the prodigy have transcended this scene? I mean, they really have. They are one of a few acts that have just gone. Yeah. Uh, did, you, did you have any idea that they would get that popular? Um, no, uh, but they, you know, they've obviously made like moves where they've changed styles from from what they were doing, um, and and gone with it and got a a, a very loyal fan base. Um, whereas we got to a point where that it wasn't only like the, our working relationship, but I didn't think that Alternate could um, move anywhere. You know, we it didn't make sense to be following any kind of path. Um, Do you think they had a plan? Um, no idea. I mean, the, the sound that they got to, you know, at one point was far removed from from the uh, the experience album um but and i i would have wanted to keep um alternate you know sounding like alternate but there was there was the the big backlash against like the whole rave scene at one point and and i didn't want it to get to a point where um we had to stop um because we were flogging a dead horse i wanted to just you know this we've got here and let, let's call it a day and I've asked how you viewed your contemporaries. How do you think you were viewed by your contemporaries? And I, you know, the, the, all of those acts that you just named as your sort of non-rivals contemporaries. Um, being be, be not that confident, and and it, you know, I've explained. I don't think I've ever thought what people would uh, think of us. I mean, people do speak highly of of alternate the, and the music. You know, and and me as as a person, I just try and be as nice as I possibly can and not upset anyone. Um, you know, <laughs> just that's, just. Do you think that's not held you back. That's not the right word because you have found lots and lots of success. But do you think that you'd have been more successful if you were actually just more of a shit? Um, yeah, and actually, had the gift of the gab, you know, could blag a few things. I'm I'm absolutely useless at it. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't. I can't. The, the whole business thing and it's it's just not me i just like making music you know and, and djing so uh i could have it would have been nice to have been a lot bigger but I would, to be honest i wouldn't change anything because if you ch even one breath is different in the past you might not be where you are now and i'm, I'm pretty happy where i am
Indeed. Uh, we're going to continue talking more about where you are and also just a bit about, you know, what makes a great rave for you, what your favourite raves were to perform. We're here with Mark Archer from Alternate and Nexus 21, of course. If you want to get in touch with us with anything at all, uh, you can do hello at the 90s rave podcast.co.uk. And why don't you join our community by heading over to our social media channels? There's loads going on there, so do join us. It's about a pressure, it's about a roar. So we're still here with uh, Mark Archer from Alternate. And Mark, I, I want to know in terms of your raves, because you are a raver as well, but let's just talk about raves in general so they can be that you perform at, that you've been at. But what is it that makes a great rave for you? Um, just a crowd that are really into the you know the music. I mean, there's, there's certain tunes that you can play that I've played. Um, you know, you drop, drop something like um, Outlander Vamp, and if it don't go down, you, you may as well just pick up your tunes and, and go. It's, it's pointless. Just the, the willingness to, to dance to, to music and, and go for it, like people used to, um, you know, back in the day. Um, I played one the beginning of, of last year just before lockdown in, in Brighton. And it was honestly one of the closest things to an old, old rave I've right. been to like since, since the nineties. What um, was it? Um, it was a 30 years of rave thing that, that okay. um, Nikki had, had sorted out with shades of rhythm, slip mat, um, Mark XDC. Um, and I, I played a warm up set. And so I was able to play a lot of different tunes that I don't normally get a chance to, to play and it was like the old days where when the tune broke down to the baseline the place went off you know when it when tunes went just like the euphoria of it all whereas now you tend to get a lot of places where you play like 30 seconds of a tune and they know what it is and it bang goes in place goes off and then the rest of the tune is really static and they're waiting for the next one right. whereas this people you know every time a tune broke down to a bit a bass line a vocal came in people were singing along it was you know it's just like when people are a bit more open-minded and, and willing to party a bit more so who what were the sort of ages of that crowd were they old people or were they younger people it, it was across it, it was a really across the board kind of thing wow. but but there was um a lot of the old heads there you know that knew the tunes right I and mean, you but need those it, old heads telling the young heads <laughs> what to do saying that there are now a generation of people who their mum and dad have brought them up on the tunes. So you look at them and they're singing all the words and you're thinking, how on earth do you know that? But <laughs> they've had these tunes played to them their entire lives. And then all of a sudden they, they're able to go to an event where, you know, the DJs are, are there playing them. Who were the DJs playing them back in the day? And their mum and dad have probably said to them, if they're ever in town, go and see them. Wow, amazing. Uh, David Tumulty asks, what were your favourite raves to play in the 90s and why? Um, probably the, the amnesia ones, um, especially at, at when we did a, a, like an amnesia at, at Shelley's, but th th it was a very like, because they were like a Midlands crew, you know, and we were like, we were from the area. So especially at, like at, at Shelley's, people acted like we were from Stoke, you know, I mean, Stafford's only, you know, to, 12 miles down the road or whatever. So uh, there was always a fantastic reception. You know, we, we always tried new tunes out there. Like Activate was played at an Amnesia gig um, for the very first time. You know, and it, we sampled like a big tune that, that used to go off in Stoke. So we knew there'd be a, like an air of familiarity about the tune. So it, it went off straight from first play. So would you play different stuff depending where you were in the country, what sort of event it was? Uh, I don't. I don't think we had th that many tunes to make uh, different sets. We we were just, you know, this is alternate. If you if right. you booked alternate, you you're going to get alternate. Yeah, yeah. yeah fair so. enough. <laughs> um, and what was the biggest rave you played at? Was it that one in Birmingham that was forty five thousand? That wasn't that, even a rave. <laughs> yeah, but I mean that that was the bi the biggest crowd at, at the time. I mean, you know, there there was like the ones at Donington Park, you know, that were over like ten thousand, and I think the first ever 
when we did at Donington Park when um, that was when I thought, you know, actually we're on to something here because we're doing a PA of just purely alternate music and there's over 10,000 people here going off to it. Um, so, you know, that, that I, I think that was that was one of my favourites. Okay. Um, have you ever just absolutely cleared the dance floor? Do you care? Uh, oh, of course I care. I've, I've cleared it, but not, <laughs> not for... Not for the, the music that I've played. I've I've played at events where maybe somebody else is their on. fault. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, they're on in another tent, right? And, okay, and they they maybe haven't played in that area for for so long. So everyone's like, um, I mean, I did. It was a bit of a strange booking, actually. It was in the past few years, and I played at a tidy weekender. Um, so everyone goes there to listen to Hard House or Trance. Um, and I was supposed to play in the back room and one of the DJs didn't turn up, so I was put on in the main room. So I came on with um, ASEN, Trip to the Moon, and everyone went in the back room to listen to Hard House. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there was, there was an hour's worth of hardcore for no one. Was it literally no one, or was there a, yeah, there was there, a handful? There, there was four people in there. Four people, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe. Well, yeah. You don't know, Mark. Those four people about the day, the, the night of their oh, life. So. Oh, they, they loved it. <laughs> Such an intimate gig. <laughs> it's true. I mean, you can't pay for that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, what's the, I mean, there's a question about what's the deadest rave you've ever played to, but I mean, you've already you've already answered yeah, yeah. that. Um, what was your biggest, de uh, your sort of biggest performing disaster? Um, oh, disaster. Um, I mean, the, the ironing board one comes, comes close. Right. Okay. Um, we, we did a gig actually, I think it was in, uh, early 92. Um, and we, we played over in Ireland, um, and we got to one of the venues and everyone was outside and we were like, what, what, why is everyone outside? There's been a bomb scare in there. So we were already like, you know, pretty nervous. And then they got, because we, we couldn't fly gear over, they got us one keyboard and there was two of us. <laughs> so there was me and Chris Andy. stood, stood, <laughs> yeah. On, and I couldn't play keyboards. So he's there like looking like he knew what he was doing. I'm just standing there, <laughs> both playing the same keyboard. We thought, that's, because it's quite dark, you know, and there's lasers and everything, maybe we'll get away with it. About halfway through the PA, the house lights came on for the rest of the PA. So there's a big M1 keyboard, two people behind it, no leads, nothing, no drape. Just, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was a bit... I mean, it, it properly went off, but okay. it just just felt, like, really awkward. And in terms of the rave scene in the nineties, did you have a partic any particular favourite DJs? Um, I mean, Doc Scott used to play a blinding uh, Belgian set. Um, at, at Shelley's, uh, I'd always look forward to the the guests who were on. Um, Mickey Finn was also. He was he, he used to play in the Midlands a hell of a lot. Yeah. You know, everyone everyone used to think that he was from the Midlands because he was he was up here so often. Um, you know, Slip Slip Matt always played a, a, a great set because the, a lot a lot of the DJs back then weren't so hot at mixing. You know, it was more about tune selection. You right. know, who got the tunes? Um, and me being a bit of a, a, a stickler, I always liked it the one the ones who were actually you know, better at mixing, um, you know, so you didn't have to go and get yourself a pint of water or whatever while, <laughs> while there's a car crash going on. So you were less about the tune selection, more about the DJ. The, the, the yeah, well, it, it was both, you know, I, it, it's nice when someone plays great tunes, but when they ruin it by car crashing every single one or scratching something really badly over the top of something, it, it, it kind of ruins it. And what did you make of the rise of the MCs? A, a, an MC is great when they they enhance a tune, um, know when to say stuff and when not to say stuff. Uh, it's, it's why Man Paris, like back in in the early nineties, 
why he was so good because he he knew what to say. He, he'd started off DJing before MCing, so he knew the tunes. So he actually got the tunes and knew when tunes, you know, broke down or when they needed to build up. So he he was absolutely on point. Um, but you know, as the scene got longer and longer, the MCs kind of you know a lot of MCs take over and dibbity bibbity all over the a tune and it's you know it's not my thing. There's there's certain MCs who know you know when to say something, when not to say something, and to me they're the best ones. It's about a pressure. It's about a roar. So, Mark, let's talk a little bit about the end of Alternate because that came in the mid '90s. Um, Kevin Webster, uh, probably not the one from Coronation Street, but you never know. <laughs> we're, we're a broad church. Uh, he says, that "If you are listening, Kevin Webster, and it is you, uh, thank you for the, all the great memories." Uh, he, Mark, Kevin Webster says, "Thank you, Mark, uh, for getting me into buying rave music." Uh, his question is. Was there a point when the music became so split in terms of genres that it affected where you could play? Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, there, there was a point where like, the, a scene called Progressive House, which it's something that no one really tends to, to mention these days, but there was a, like a, a certain um, few labels putting out a, a sound where they liked you know, the, the stab noises and stuff, but they didn't like it as fast as hardcore was going. So it kind of like bought it all all back. Um, and I I thought we weren't going to go down in clubs like this. We got booked to play um, two, both of them were up in Scotland. And I was really surprised that because all the music up, up to the point we got onto the stage were, you know, was very like laid back, piano-y, low tempo and then we came on and just but they you know they they, they went off and I, I think we had a quite a, a broad appeal but it did get to the point where music was going faster than than alternate i mean the, the prodigy were quite clever with their experience album because they remixed all the tracks to keep up with the scene whereas our album was the tracks that we'd made um you know they were like the same kind of versions. Did you, um, did, did you not like the speed? You wanted to stay as you were, and that just meant that, unfortunately, there's no place for you in in, in, in that current scene. I, no, I, I, I didn't mind the, the, the speed at all. I, I wasn't mad keen on the whole chipmunk vocal thing. That's one thing that really put me off, and, and, and there was a lot of t- tunes doing exactly the same thing, sampling the same pianos and stuff. And it, and it, it it seemed as though there was, it, for for a period, the scene lost a lot of creativity, but then all of a sudden it it, it sprung from like, you know, the what was hardcore to happy hardcore and to jungle and people went off to techno and you know previously, people who were more into the garage kind of thing and then and and then trance was like starting to rear its head as well so. It, Alternate didn't really fit into any of those, which was, you know, one of the reasons and we wanted to concentrate on Nexus 21 um, and, you know, start doing some more like proper Detroit kind of techno thing. But it, it coincided with uh, where our, our working relationship um, got to the point of, of no return. So we, it's, we kind of called it a day with Alternate with a plan to start as Nexus 21, but it never happened. So yeah, tell us about that uh, and you and Chris falling out. What, what what happened? You said your professional relationship broke down. What went on? He he was more into um, computers than the music. He was never actually into the music. We he never came out to clubs when we did a PA. Um, a, you know, he'd, he'd stay in his car until we went on, do the PA, get back in his car and go. Uh, you know, whereas I'd pack up and go in, into the crowd. Um, and it, the, 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 the gap between us just kind of grew. And I think as well as when you start making tunes with somebody, it's a bit like a relationship where, you know, you, you have a bit of a thing in common with someone. But then when you spend so much time with someone, like, you know, every single weekend and we we're, we're like sharing hotels all the time, and you get to 
notice people's bad points and stuff and you, and you weren't start friends and, really were you before, no well we were, it we was never, a relation no, yeah never never friends and and that just widened over the the three years we were doing alternate right uh, could it have been saved or was it absolutely that it was unsavable no no there was there was there were certain things that put the uh, the nail into the the coffin really um okay to elaborate um Someone trying to sue you basically for something that you've done. It. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of people. A lot of people say, "Why don't? Why? Why? Why didn't you stay?" Well, you know that that kind of marred it a bit. So, what, uh, did he, what, did he, what, what was the threat of <clears throat> suing over? Well, I, the same with when we were doing Nexus Twenty One, and there was the alternate thing, and we got too many tunes to put out as one thing. Um, I was doing um, stuff under the name DJ Nex. Um, which was like more underground stuff, and and a lot of the DJ Next tracks ended up as alternate tracks. Like "Hole in the Speaker" was supposed to be DJ Next. We did a track. I did a track called "Respect Is Due." <laughs> That ended up as an alternate track. Uh, the very last single, Everybody. was uh, It was for the third uh, DJ Next EP. And someone said, that's too good to be a DJ Next tune. You want to use it as, as an alternate tune. So Chris was getting a bit peeved about the... He was like, it's always your ideas. Um, but I was just the one who was like into the music so i was doing you know the most stuff and then i started doing some like progressive house stuff under the name zen mantra and the first zen mantra thing like blew up in in 93 um and there was actually a plan about this it wasn't like an accident i aimed it at a specific club used their club logo named all the tracks around the club name um and it did really well, and I got paid for it. And Chris phoned up and said he wanted half the money for it because we got on a kind of an agreement where half of alternate, you know, rather than argue, we'd just split everything down the middle. Um, and because it was purely by me and not by alternate on Exodus 21, he's like, wait a minute, this is, you know, just me. And it, well, get yourself a good solicitor, I'm going to see you. Ah. Uh, yeah. How did you feel about that? That that's the end of the working relationship. Right. Okay. And and how did you feel about the fact that you were going your separate ways? Were you were you sad? Were you relieved? It was. Uh, you know, I was making stuff on my own, but I always felt like kind of protected by this. You know, I'm with that label. I'm in this group. Um. You know, the confidence thing, and then it's like I'm I'm totally on my own here. Mm. Um. But luckily, I'd I'd started working with uh, Danny Torres. And, and we started a, a slow motion. And the first track we did, you know, like bombed into the charts. So it, it kind of proved, you know, that I, I could uh, still do stuff. So it was it was all right. There was there was just, a, you know, a few weeks where I thought, like, what, what am I going to do? Well, uh, you continued to perform, didn't you, under the name of Alternate for a bit at least. And then uh, that, Chris, caused further problems for you there by saying that you couldn't use the alternate name and trademarks. Um, again, how did you feel when he, when he did that? It, it seems pretty malicious, that. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, considering I was, I was half of alternate, why am I not allowed to use the name? Mm. But um, for, for a portion, I wasn't until the record label. Um, in 2013, someone um, from down south started up a, a page, alternate for Christmas number one. Um, no idea how to achieve it. It was just they they wanted alternate to to beat the the X Factor thing. <laughs> um, but through that campaign, uh, the record label actually said, "Well, when you came to us and said you wanted to do this side project, you were called Alienate." And they sent the record away. The first release when it came back, it said alternate. And we're like, "You've got the name wrong." As well, it's a bit late. So they thought up the name so no one could say we couldn't have permission of it. And they said, well, if you want to use it, you're fine. 
Right. Okay. So, so, you, so, so you did. Yeah. I mean, it, it got it got very uh, got very tricky at the point because obviously I wasn't allowed to uh, to use a name for a, a, a period. No one wanted to book me under my own name. Gigs that I'd already got booked. I said, you can't put Alton out on the fly. And they're like, oh, well, it cancelled you. Yeah. You know, did, so. Did, did you not ring up Chris and be like, mate, come on, man. What, what is going on? Or had that relationship totally broken down to the point where you couldn't even call him on the phone? Um, I did try try to uh, do a T-shirt range and said, look, you know, we could, if we can put aside our differences um, and do a t-shirt and maybe maybe make some money straight away once I'd contacted my address, uh, email address details and everything, sent off to a solicitor and I was getting bombarded with solicitor stuff. So, you know, it, it gone way, way past right. uh, anything. Now I take it you haven't spoken to him since? Nope. Any idea what he's up to? Nope. Do you care? No, I've I've not I've not <laughs> seen him since ni- 1994 was the last time I saw him. Wow. So. But how does that make you feel that you that you shared so many exciting high moments with someone, uh, mm. not just in the studio, but on top of the pops, <laughs> and then that's it? Yeah, it's it's a shame, you know, because it it kind of spoils the memory of you know everything that, that you know the gigs and stuff. It leaves a, a bad taste. But like I said, if I'd have changed anything, I wouldn't be here now. You know, there's certain things that I did after alternate. You know, different projects and on different labels, and that I wouldn't have done if if I'd have carried on. So, so. I'm... And looking looking back at alternate um, in a positive sense, how much do you feel that you set the path for where hardcore went in the future? Um, I think, a, a, along with everyone else who made that kind of music, you, you know, we we set the blueprint for um, people who are, who say making it now. You know, they they look back at. Uh, uh, at the tunes and they either want to do something like a similar style to them or pe- people say like i've been trying to do stuff like alternate and I, I did a sample pack and now i've got your sound you know i can sound a bit more like you so which is, which is nice you know it's we didn't even think that we were going to last like beyond a year when we were making tunes back then so to be here still 30 years later you know we're being able to play you know when when there are gigs um, and, and still be kind of re- relevant, you know, but also people saying, you know, we got them into making music and they want to sound like us. You know, how do you get that alternate sound? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's massively flattering. And, and, and what did you, how did, what did you make of Happy Hardcore and the way that that went? I know you mentioned in like the Chipmunk vocals, but it was, it's, it's a wholly different sound towards the end yeah. of the night that it was when you were at your peak creating hardcore yeah that? it's not not my thing not your thing <laughs> that's very polite way of saying <laughs> uh, politely i'm not i'm not ever going to slag a, cut, a certain kind of music because <laughs> just because it's not not what i'm into doesn't mean it's shit you know loads of people love it yeah so you yeah. know a fair, fair play to them but it's not you not to my taste and it eventually did uh, suffer and struggle and die after outstripping the popularity of jungle for a bit but jungle is gone on to become drum and bass and it's become this absolute juggernaut really around mm. the world with festivals devoted to it with tens of thousands of people going to it and chart hits um what did jungle do so right that hardcore happy hardcore or hardcore just did so wrong i, I just think it, it it stuck at it and and remained even when there was chart hits it remained underground um you know when the, when there's parodies of, of themselves. Whenever a new like style starts, someone will try and make a tune like something else and come out with something completely different. And then we'll go, "That's a totally different genre." And then a few people will try it, and then a lot of people hear that sound, and then they start making it. And then you'll get the people who are like, "Oh, actually, this is big." So then they'll start doing remixes of something a different style in that style, and then you get the gimmicks. Jungles never had that. Jungles never had like the you know the gimmick tunes or or the 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 constant retreading of old classics. 
Why do you think uh, that is? What, what's, what's the difference between the, the, the producers and the DJs in, that went down that happy hardcore route, that went down that jungle route? Why did that happen that, that those that went down, as you just said, you know, the, those sort of gimmicks and the retreading mm. and, and those that went down jungle didn't appear to? I, I think because there were so many styles inside jungle itself, all the different steps, um, plus the fact the music relied heavily on it being very innovative as far as the the production, always trying to find like the next production technique rather than relying on gimmicks. Uh, so it's, all, it's, rest- all, it's always on, very forward finish. thinking, very very okay. forward thinking kind of music. Okay, um, and there's been a resurgence actually in that old sounding ninety one to ninety five sound. Um, are you are you a fan of it? What the, the stuff that's being created? There's loads of great stuff coming out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, all all the the club glow guys, um, uh, you know, Denim Audio, Barai, uh, West Norwood Set Library, um, the the local group guys, um, all the, everyone doing that kind of hardcore sound. You know, but. You know, with with great production, unlike it, it used to be, um, <laughs> and it's it's fantastic. You know, they're, they're kicking out some amazing tunes. I've been doing like a, a series of mixes where I've basically anything that's got a breakbeat in it. You know, where it doesn't matter what kind of genre it is, and and putting together mixes and and, and those guys feature very heavily in the mixes because they're they're doing the the best stuff. Do you think that there's uh... Part of the reason why this there's been a, some sort of resurgence in that hardcore sound was that the tr- the, the the period of travel uh, of change, the speed of change that happened in the nineties, has, has left so much left still to to explore. Yeah, well, I, I, I think there was there was so many changes that that there was so many different like kind of genres in such a short space of time, where people can pick at it. I mean, if you if you look at <clears throat> Like house now, you can play anything from the past 10, 20 years, and a lot of it sounds ex- extremely similar. You know, whereas you look at the speed between eighty eight and ninety three, and how completely different the the sounds were. So you've got all those different sounds to to choose from. You know, if you're if you're going to go back and and produce something like that. There's there's the vast array of all the different influences that come in from all um, and plus combinations that weren't necessarily thought, you know, back then. You know, you'd you'd get like your big stabs from a Belgian techno record, put them over a breakbeat, and, and that'd be like something new. Whereas now, you know, they're they're combining like like trance sounds over breakbeats, you know, which it's it's like something that's not been as long as it's not too trance, it's cool with me. Uh, and there's been loads of documentaries about Acid House, but I, as far as I'm aware, I, I've never really seen a documentary about hardcore. And, and we've seen some recently about the history of drum and bass, but of course, that is ultimately the history of hardcore in a way. But there's never been a documentary, I don't think, about how hardcore came out of Acid House and became a new genre that eventually split that split into those two very, very different, but you know. Past successful yeah. time scenes. Would you like to see a documentary like that? Oh, oh, that oh, to- totally, because because that sound is more of a countrywide sound. Whereas when you ever see documentaries about Acid House, it, it fairly and squarely looks at London. You know, even though it happened all up and down the country all at the same time, it's always you know the same story that that's that's told about Acid House. Um, you know, you, you'll occasionally get the the token Grand Park or Mike Pickering from the Hacienda, like that's the only other place it was played. But like hardcore, you know, and the whole race scene, it was the length and breadth of the country, uh, you know. So the, there's a lot of people who could get involved, and and the different different regional styles as well. Whereas Acid House was just one thing. You had to, in that in that era of the raves, you had different styles being played, whereas. It'd probably be across the board, but more heavily breakbeat towards London, uh, you know, a bit more like piano led up north, um, you know, and up in Scotland. Um, and ultimately, you know, it, it went like really hard up in Newcastle and, and Scotland, you know, and 
up towards Gabba kind of thing, whereas you know down down south it went more jungle. You know, so there, there's a there's a lot of different styles to encompass in that. So it would be a, a great documentary. Well, we hope you're enjoying today's episode of Raw. But now's where we ask you, inevitably, for your help to keep this project rolling on. We're a tight-knit team of four working part-time for free, taking no wages at this project to create this podcast. And it's quite a serious undertaking alongside our normal day jobs. Hopefully you can see from our progression from audio to video in the few months since we started this podcast that, thanks to your ongoing donations, we've managed to improve our equipment. And I'm pleased to say your generosity means this podcast now washes its own face in terms of costs, which is absolutely great news. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much to any of you who've donated. Uh, We've got big, big plans for the future, but we aren't going to be able to do it without your support. So if you want us to keep making Raw, you're going to need to keep on funding Raw. And that will help with the cost of renting or buying recording kit and paying expenses to travel the country and interview more of your favourite rave artists from the 90s. So if you can spare anything at all, no matter how big or how small, you can do so at gofundme.com forward slash the 90s rave podcast. That URL again is gofundme.com forward slash the 90s rave podcast and if you're not in a position to donate because we know it's a tough time for everybody you can instead help by subscribing and sharing our content on youtube facebook instagram and twitter you just need to search for raw the 90s rave podcast go and do that now please massive love and respect to each and every one of you hope you're enjoying it so mark archer from uh, alternate next to 21 and bizarre inc let's uh, wrap this up by sort of uh, taking a little look back from now here we are 30 years on since the 90s you've managed to carve uh, a career for yourself in music i know it's tough at the moment obviously we've discussed yeah. that uh, earlier on but how easy or hard have you found it in that in that subsequent 20 years since the end of the 90s or even 25 years since you 26 years since you went separately with alternate to 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 uh, carve out a career in music um i mean t- straight from from alternate i was doing the the slow motion um and myself and danny um started up a record label called called dancer records um and that that was just like before the the fledgling like sunday scene that turned into like speed garage um and then i kind of for for or like a year fell out of love with uh, the whole music thing because it nothing seemed to be going right at all. But that coincided with um, me being asked whether I'd do uh, some alternate uh, DJing. And like in the early 90s, I wasn't really known for for DJing. So from, from 2000 onwards, the DJing has been the thing that I've, uh, I've, I've really concentrated on. But also... I've been able to go back to how I was before Alternate, where I was making different styles of music. So I've, I've been able to do like Acid House, uh, like Nexus 21 style, like Detroit Techno, as well as, uh, you know, like uh, breakbeat and hardcore stuff. Um, so it's, it's been good, really. Although, you know, not, not the success that Alternate had. I've been allowed to do so many different kinds of styles rather than, you know, just just concentrating on one. I think there's a general feeling among fans, and I get this when I when 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 you hear from people who tune into these podcasts that there's this idea that rave artists are somehow well off, and I think a lot of that has come to the surface. Um, during, at the start of lockdown, I saw a lot of that being like, "Why are they complaining? They've got loads of money. They should be able to suck up a year's worth of wages." And you're like, yes. I mean, most people can't do that, but rave artists, I don't think they're as well paid as people think, are they? No, no. I mean, we we live week to week, really. Um, you know, if it's if I don't play every weekend, that that's like someone's not having a week's worth of wages. Um, you know, and it's <clears> that there've there've been years where certain months I've not played at all. I mean, it, it got to the point when I wasn't allowed to use the name. Um, I, I lost my house. Yeah, wow. it, it, yeah. So it's it, it does get. Get tricky, you know. If if that's can the I only thing, when, can I ask when that was, Mark. That was um, around 2011 when when I moved. I mean, it's it fantastically lucky that I met Nikki, and and she said, "Why don't you come and move in with me?" And I had to 
hand the keys back to uh, the bank for my the, the house that I was living in. You know, and that that was a house that I wanted to keep for my kids, but there was just no way because I got no no gigs, and y- you can't just find a job just like that and suddenly start paying. You know, your your mortgage the following week. It's it's very difficult. How did that feel? Um, you kind of instilled uh, my generation by your parents. You know, you, you go out, you get a job, you you meet someone, you have kids, you have, get a house, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I've, I've split up, um, been married three times, split up twice. Um, the first house that I bought, you know, that that's still there. Um, but I left that behind for, for my kids, you know, moved on, managed to get a, a, another house and unfortunately lost that. So, you know, there's only so many times you can... You can do it. Um, I'm surprised you're not angrier, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's the thing, you know, I, I, I could be. I told you I've got grumpy down pat there, don't worry. <laughs> uh, but not angry. Was there any ever a point where you did consider quitting altogether, where you just thought, I, I, can't, I can't deal with this constant um, stress of, of living week by week in the way you've just described? Yeah, it, 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 that, that has been because it's, it's not only yourself that you're putting it through. You know, it's, you're putting a burden on the people around you when you can't pay for things. Um, and it's just like, you know, if, if I'm not getting any bookings, no one wants to book me. There's no point, you know, pretending. And, you know, I may as well just, just try, and, try and get less, myself, a, you know, a, a proper job and, and carry on like that. But Nikki, you know, she sees something in me that a lot of times I don't see in myself. And she says, you, you know, you love doing it and you're not giving it up. And, oh. and, you know, she's been fantastic. How wonderful to have a support like that. Yeah, That's amazing. Totally. And how have you managed it, do you think, to stay relevant 30 years on where you're playing out to an event and the kids are coming and, and going, oh, I like that. You know, wow, this is fantastic. And you are making new music as well. Yeah. Um, I, I've always played different events than just old school events. And I don't know why. I think it's because of, like, the techno background. So I played, like, a lot of techno um events you know and where people say like you this is you know the past where it's come from kind of thing and an influence so you, if there's ever a stage where like techno tunes are using old old school stabs i kind of get booked um at those so um it it it, it is a, a ponder sometimes why i'm still allowed to to play out i mean incredibly incredibly grateful um but now, now you've got like the, this new generation of people who've been brought up on um, the tunes. Plus, there's also a generation of people where they've never heard of it before. I mean, you had like the people who went out to raves, then maybe their younger brothers and sisters, and uh, the y- real younger ones who've been pl- playing music constantly by their older brothers and sisters. Um, but then you've got like this. I've played gigs where people have come up to Nikki and said, like, what is this music? Where can I buy it from? Is this is this like a a, a different uh, offshoot of breaks? Like, no, this is like thirty years old. Well, I mean, that sort of brings me on to the question: is that How do you feel about your early nineties music looking back now, and how well has it aged? Um, well, people people still dance to it, so it, yeah. <laughs> it can't can't be that. But I'm incredibly proud of of a lot of the alternate uh, music. It's uh, you know. Um, really glad I did it and really, really pleased that so many people still like it and play it. And what music do you prefer, your old stuff or your new stuff? A bit, bit of both. <laughs> I mean, like like Infiltrate, you know, that that's just one tune I'm incredibly proud of. Um, it, it wasn't a throwaway thing. Um, it's It's the one that really changed things for us. Okay. Uh, and is Bang Face among your favourite of the modern raves? I know obviously we mentioned you got married there, um, but is it one of your favourites? Yeah, it's it's just, it's more about the atmosphere there, where whereas like in the old raves, you know, everyone used to be really friendly. You know, you could go to a Bang Face, like a, one of the first times I ever took Nikki, and she was like, I want to go back to the chalet and go and get, go and get something like, and it's like, well, do you want me to come with you? No, 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 you sound. And she wandered off it, like out into the chalets and people actually said, do you want us to walk with you? 
you know it's it's so friendly there you know the, never any trouble it's just the atmosphere of everyone going for it which is so close to how it used to be well keith w bond on instagram asks how did you get involved with bang face in the first place and um, they booked us for one of their club nights down in london i think it was at 2005 um and we went there just you know to to play as you know dj there um, it was just a, a booking, no idea about the, the club at all. Got there and the music, because they, they play like Gabba, Speedcore, just like, you know, some of the maddest kind of music going. And I was thinking, what on earth are we doing here? You know, I'm, I'm playing like Anthem by enjoying stuff. Just thinking we are not going to go down. And you dropped it and the place went absolutely ballistic. You know, because they love everything that goes on there. Um, but I honestly thought, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't get booked again. And then the following year, they booked us to play. They they were doing a stage at uh, the Glade Festival, um, and we were we were playing there on the Sunday evening. It was one of those sets where technically it's possibly not the best set we've ever played, but. It was just the right place at the right time. Again, very lucky. Sun going down, you know, you played LFO and the place just uh, tore it a new one. It was just unbelievable. And ever since then, you know, they've, they've been absolutely amazing and, and continued to book me. Well, and not only did they continue to book you, they let you get married on stage. And yeah. uh, uh, Barnaby Kingsford wants to know about that wedding on stage there in 2016. He says, was it the solemn and romantic ceremony he dreamed of since he was little? <laughs> <laughs> it was honestly it was it was one of the most surreal experiences of my life um because we we got we we got engaged uh, after a bang face it was like monday morning after a weekend uh, when they used to be down at camber sands um near hastings so because we got engaged at a bang face nikki wanted to get married at a bang face and james who, who was one of the main organizers there he was well up for the idea and they do like an opening and closing ceremony. Um, and they always have like a certain thing go on at the opening ceremony. Um, one time they had like uh, Dave Benson Phillips and his gunge tank. Um, one year, they, they, it was a Guinness World Record attempt at making the world's biggest glow stick where they Brilliant. got like this ma honestly it was like a massive and they poured the two different chemicals in and it glowed up and um and he said like a wedding would be amazing like actually on stage um and they changed the words to hymns and had the hymns up on the big light boards it was like give me joy in my heart keep me raving oh, and you, so you've got like the whole crowd singing these mad hymns <laughs> Um, and they they baptized two of the people out of the crowd to be ordained into the rave as <laughs> as witnesses, you know. And, and and then we went straight from because there was me and Nikki both wearing masks on stage at, at Bang Face. They give out Nikki. like, how did you know it was Nikki? So did you she, might have married someone else. <laughs> she she's she, such a good sport, you know. And she had she had a um, they throw inflatables out. Yeah. During like, the whole weekend, she had an inflatable bouquet. <laughs> and then we went straight from the wedding ceremony into like a live PA. So we had like the, you know, the dancers and everyone. So evaporate was our first dance. So there's me and Nikki like smooching to evaporate on stage. That's fantastic. That's yeah. amazing. And was it, the, was it the, the ceremony that you dreamed of? Oh, oh t w then and then some, you know, it was, it was something, you know, you, could, you couldn't have wished for better. It was, it was unreal. Fantastic. What a lovely experience. Uh, and, and in terms of, I know you, your kids have grown up, but um, I mean, they're in their mid-20s now. So back in the day when you were with Alternate, you were just about to become a dad. And, and then, you know, you're still performing at the weekends and that sort of stuff. How did you balance that constant being away, really, and playing late nights at the weekend? I used to work overnights uh, on a radio show and, and it really impacts upon your family life. How did you find that? How did you balance that? Um, I mean, it's, I, I can remember a time like going, going away DJ and coming back and being handed um, Emma 
And oh, she's just had some soup. Pan, but bruh, oh, damn it. Oh. <laughs> I've just driven all the way from Peterborough and now I've got warm tomato soup all over me. It's just, you, you know, you, you balance, balance being a, um, a, a, a dad as best you can. It, it, it stopped my productivity right at the very start when they were, when they were little because I stayed at home um, looking after Emma and Liam. Um, and, you know, you can't go and sit in your studio while they're downstairs, like ca causing havoc, crawling all over the place. So, you know, you had to stay and watch them. And similarly, you know, when, when you're allowed to go in your studio, you can't suddenly whisk up a tune because you've got half an hour. Um, so it, it, it did stop me making music for, for a brief period of time. Um, but, you know, they, they seem to have fared quite, quite well. They know do, they like, do they like your music? They know dad's job's different. Um, I, I don't think I'll make anything that, they, that they're really into. Um, I mean, Emma collects records. Um, you know, she's, she's blagged Todd Edwards records off me in the past. Like, I, I wonder if you know about Todd Edwards. Um, but, you know, and Liam, Liam's even done a, um, a mix, you know, and, it, and it's a better mix than a lot of highly paid DJs can do. So, you oh, know, wow, quite, wow. very, very proud of how all three of them have turned out. Great. But none of, none of them are in the music industry, though. No, no, no. Okay. Um, and has it, how, how have you found, I know that you mentioned that you've been divorced twice before. Was that anything to do with your schedule? You don't have to go into too much detail about it. I'm just wondering whether it's been hard perhaps to maintain relationships as well because of work. Um, no, no, it's not, it's, it's not been, I mean, luckily Nikki is like, she's into going to, to clubs yeah. and, you know, like every weekend when she's, she's not looking after her kids, she, while I was gigging, she'd be there with me, you know, right. and, and she's my agent. Um, so right. yeah, she, she's absolutely turned my career around, you know, the past few years. Um, but, but previously um no it, it, it didn't didn't make it difficult uh you know they, they they'd come along with you not necessarily be massively into what you're doing i can remember taking uh activate and and infiltrate home to my then girlfriend playing on being absolutely buzzed up like this is amazing check what we it's all right <laughs> absolute buzz killer you know <laughs> some people are into it some people aren't you know yeah, of course. And uh, so, obviously, you, you're not performing at the moment, and that's been financially difficult for you, of course. Yeah. Um, but also, in terms of the performing side of it, I know that you're, you that you say that you're not a, a show off or anything like that, but you, you must buzz off the thrill of performing. Oh. How much have you missed that? Oh yeah. T t I mean, I've I've tried very hard not to go through old photos. I've not looked through my Google Calendar at what gigs were supposed <laughs> to be happening. Um, you know, I see a lot of people saying, I really miss this on, on on Facebook. And if I did that, I think I'd make it worse for myself. You know, I've just tried to carry on and, and know that one day it, it's going to come back, you know, and we're, we're all going to enjoy it a hell of a lot more. Um, Can you see but, any benefits from what you've done in terms of, like, you know, not having to travel, not having to do that? You know, you're spending quality time at home. Have there been oh, yeah, any? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, 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 been, it's been fantastic, especially, like, the you know, the, the first lockdown uh, – fantastic weather managed to get the garden all done um you know do do bits on the house and spend a hell of a lot of time with with nikki um you know we, we've had it i'm so glad i'm with her I, I think i'd have gone absolutely you know stir crazy if if i wasn't with her um no. you know I was, I was on my own for five years before i met her and i think if if this had happened then it, it'd be a very different picture I think you're probably right. And uh, I know you've been doing some painting and decorating back to your old school uh, job, <laughs> but uh, I'm surprised, frankly, you're not a PPE gazillionaire because uh, there's lots of people who've become very, very wealthy off the back of the PPE. And if anyone can source a bit of quality PPE, <laughs> it's you. And in fact, Scott Cooper asks, now that everyone else is wearing face masks, does he go around telling people, I used to do that before it was cool? <laughs> uh, do you know what? Like, right from before it kind of reached this company when it was in, in China. Um, I was getting tagged in, in anything that had people wearing masks. You know, <laughs> if, if anyone goes up in their loft or does a bit of decorating at home, I get tagged on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, you know, alternate, blah, blah, blah. 
<laughs> and then since since the start where everyone's wearing masks, I've been tagged so many times, and people were saying, you know, you need to start making masks. And I didn't I didn't want to you know profit off something that's that's a, a bad situation at the mm. end of the day. But you, I was getting like so many tweets and messages like you're missing a trick here. You should do this. Why on earth aren't you doing it? And I did do it, and then straight away got like the backlash. Oh, you're milking the situation. You know, you 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 can't you can't win. You know, there's so many people who wanted a, a mask with an A on. Uh, you know, so so we did them just just for those people who who liked it. But obviously, you get you get slated by the people who masks are a load of rubbish and all this. Like, you know, you you just can't you can't I mean, win. Crap. Twats really have come to the fore during this pandemic, haven't they? They really yes. fucking have. But, uh, and go on. The, with with the, the the suits, I think those those suits that we wear, they're only good for making you hot in a nightclub. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't have done anything, <laughs> especially not the masks. It goes the disease. Um, and uh, just finally, in this segment, and then we're gonna we're gonna look back on uh, sort of sum up the, your '90s experience. When do you anticipate? And and I suppose that you're probably better plugged into this than, than a lot of people being as uh, Nicky is part of We Are Viable. When do you anticipate that live music, raves, etc., will come back and in what form? Or, or is it still just totally unknown? I'm hoping that by next year they'll be back with a, a, a like a trickle of, I don't think it's going to be a blam, everything's back and everything's back to how it was. It's going to be a very slow road this year to getting gigs back uh you know they've obviously got to trial things and and put uh plans to the government you know how how it can be done um the, the vaccine will help immensely um so just just fingers crossed that that we can get like a bit of an incline and back to some sort of normality for for next year It's about a pressure. It's about a roar. So, Mark Archer from Alternate and Nexus 21 and Bizarre Inc. Just uh, looking back, um, could you picture what your life might have been like without the 90s rave scene? Uh, I'd have been a butcher. <laughs> well, <that's true. laughs> You'd have been the best yeah. butcher in Stafford. <laughs> uh, well, I'd, I'd, have done, I'd have done my best. But, yeah, that, it would have been without that, I'd, I'd, have been, I'd have ended up being a butcher or, you know, something like that. Um, okay. or carrying on with the painting and decorating. You know, I, I did that just to try and follow my dad. Can't stand doing it, really hate doing it, but it's, you know, he, he gave me a skill. Nice, okay. Uh, and uh, all of us listening, well, largely all of us, I would have thought, still adore the 90s rave scene. There's a reason why people listen to the 90s rave podcast. Um, why do you think that, that it stood the test of time in, in that way? I think it's all to do with the memories, um, you know, certain tunes evoke such amazing memories. Um, you know, you, you can play any number of tunes and you'll remember, you know, the, the, the first time you heard it, the first place you heard it. Well, even if it's on like a, a cassette round your mate's house, you know, the, the, all of the tunes evoke some sort of memories. And the, the, there's never been a scene since where it had such a euphoric nature really so it's uh, it, it's just I, th I think that's why people hark back to it plus the fact you always tend to be you know that you may get into different kinds of musics throughout your life it always tends to be the big one like in your teen years or after you've left school that is the one that you always look back at you know and you do that oh they don't make it like they used to it you know, seems to me though mark that it that, that it was a movement the, it was the last mass underground movement because the internet was, obviously came around after that and now whatever you're into, you can find it. Whereas at that point it was new because it was dance music, uh, electronic music, and you had to know about it from someone handing you a tape or whatever. It was a, There was a, a big buzz and yeah. I don't think that now will ever exist again. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it was like the, la the last time when uh, people would like a record is released now and it can be released on digital and then three months later the you know the, the physical copies come out and there's no like big blam the records out and everyone saves up for that point you know it's that, that that's that's been totally lost but then again you know the way the way music is listened to the way people 
you know, value music is is completely differently now. You know, he, he, those records from from that day where you you put a price on them, you, they're physical, they're there. You know, it's totally it's totally different now. And what was your favourite year of the nineties for raving, performing, whatever? What if you if you could pick one year that was just amazing for you? <sighs> I liked like 88, 89, 90, 91, all for different reasons. But I think 91, probably because that was the year when things, you know, really started to change, you know, with Infiltrate made such a massive change to, you know, what what, what we were doing and how, and how successful we were, you know. And, and from, from Alternate being at the start of 91, not much of a known entity to buy the end of 91 being number three in the charts. You know, it was a it was a pretty big year. Yeah, I can I can see why you'd say that. And um will you be a rave artist, DJ, producer, etc. forever, or do you ever see yourself retiring? As as long as people want to listen to me, I think I'll still, you know, I'll still make and play that kind of music. It's either that or if I ever play a club where they've got those seats that have got like the, the gold uh, metal with the burgundy velour. If I ever play in one of those venues, that's when I think I'll stop. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, to be honest, you probably would take playing in one of those venues right now, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, 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 all day, every day. <laughs> um, and uh, finally, if uh, you could choose any one figure from the 90s rave scene uh, to, to, to be on the podcast, uh, who would you like to hear from and why? I mean, we may have already had them, of course, but uh, it, it, who's your who's the person that you'd really love to hear from? I think a uh, pretty obvious one is Liam from The Prodigy. Yeah, um, he's he's, yeah. he's a tough cookie to nail yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's, yeah, he's straight, in with, straight in with the difficult one. But yeah, he, you know, he, he'd be very interesting um, to hear him talk about that era particularly. Okay. Uh, well, we are trying, uh, and uh, and it was actually it was an ultimate aim. You, you were up there as well, but you was he, he's a he's a big aim of mine. He was from the very yeah. start, and uh, I think because because he had, I think he's probably become the the man who's driven Ray forward the most into the mainstream over the, the years. I don't know. You could probably probably ask some, you know, suggest someone else. But I mean, like someone like Carl Cox left. So, whereas the prodigy have remained a rave act that became popular, uh, I think that's the difference, yeah, right? Yeah, he's like the Apex Twin in rave, really, isn't he? Indeed, uh, Mark. Listen, it's been great talking to you. Uh, you've been such a great sport, and thank you for giving us such a, a generous amount of your time. I know that it's a, a difficult time for you, but we all really, really hope that this uh, sorts itself out soon. Not just for us personally, Fingers but for, for you as well, and uh, and for Nikki, and 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 keep doing what you're doing because it's really great. Cheers. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Good stuff. Cheers. Well, that's it from another episode of Raw. We hope you've enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. We're now an all-video platform, so if you're listening on audio, please do check out our YouTube page for this episode filmed, plus loads more besides. And you can also find us on Facebook, Insta, and Twitter. Just search for Raw, the 90s Ray podcast. Plus, if you can spare just a few quid to help us continue making more great 90s rave content and hopefully keeping a smile on your face at a difficult time, you can do so at gofundme.com forward slash the 90s rave podcast. All donations will be ploughed back into the podcast, including expenses to get around the country, interviewing some of your rave favourites and also improving our equipment. It's about a pressure, it's about a roar.